you've just come, come back from, from Lebanon and um, doing some research on the refugee um, issue. It's a crucial issue for every Palestinian, but I think few people really understand it. So what did you discover by talking to uh, Palestinian refugees in, in Lebanon? Um, well, first of all, I, I did an interview in Lebanon on Future TV, which is the network of the Hariri family, the, of his, his political movement. And I did the interview before, you can watch it online, you can watch it on my blog, maxblumenthal.com. And I did the interview before I was able to go into the camps and talk to people. And I really regret not being more critical, if not um, indignant um, on this network about um, the treatment of Palestinian refugees um, and especially uh, Rafiq Hariri's role and the, and the future movement's role in um, passing a version of uh, the Nuremberg Laws against Palestinian refugees. Um, and you know, Yeah, I really deeply regret that I wasn't able to express that on this channel. Uh, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are barred from 74 professions, which effectively bars them from working. Um, you talk to, I talk to people, especially um, young Maronites, and they remind me of uh, when I talk to mainstream Israelis about Palestinians and their racist attitudes and their um, sort of um, their justification for the racist treatment of Palestinian refugees. They tell me it's complicated, but that they tried to conquer the country and these jobs have to be reserved for Lebanese people, which was Hariri's original justification um, for ramming through um, these laws. They're also um, based, substantially barred from um, bringing construction materials into, the cam into their camps, um, and now there's um, new restrictions in the works um, to prevent UNRWA, um, the United Nations Relief Works Agency, um, from bringing building materials in as well. And UNRWA is responsible for the schooling and providing pretty much everything for the Palestinian refugees. So I went to Shatila camp, which is the site of the um, famous massacre by the Falangist Christian militia, which was basically a proxy of Israel. And Israel provided the um, logistics for them to commit this massacre. And so I saw the mass graves um, in the camp. Um, most of those who were killed were women. And so there's an enormous poster showing the um, portraits of all, many of the women who were killed, who could have, who could be identified. Um, people don't know that um, a few, a handful of the women who were killed were Jewish. Um, they had married Palestinian men before being ethnically cleansed out of um, what is now called Israel. Um, I was in Burj El Brajne, which actually I found worse. Um, the conditions to be worse than Shatila camp. Uh, this is the site of the War of the Camps. Um, it was attacked uh, by the Amal movement. Um, uh, tanks were firing into this camp almost at point-blank range. Um, near the Shatila camp is a massive graveyard, which was actually built um, thanks to the help of a uh, mayor in the area who is affiliated with Hezbollah. Um, which contains the graves of all of, you know, assassinated um, members of Arafat's inner circle. It contains a mass grave um, to the victims of the Tal al Zatar massacre, who were massacred by uh, members of the Maronite community and the Falangist militia. Um, it contains the grave of Hassan Kanafani, um, the former PFLP spokesman and the, one of the greatest Palestinian intellectuals and literary icons, who was. Um, killed in a targeted assassination by Israel. Um, the grave is located in the back of the cemetery. It's covered in brush. It's very difficult to find. The cemetery itself has sort of fallen into disrepair and people come um, to visit their relatives and they'll pour water on the graves with a water bottle just to wash it off and you'll find dead flowers here and there. It's really uh, the, the cemetery is sort of a testament to what's become of Palestinian resistance in Lebanon against um, the you know, original perpetrators of injustice against them. And I'll get back to that. But first and foremost, um, the Palestinian refugees are engaged in um, sort of a campaign to secure their rights within Lebanon, not as um, citizens, but as civilians. And all of the Lebanese parties, the only thing that unites all the Lebanese parties and factions is the desire to prevent Palestinian refugees from obtaining their civilian rights. Um, 
perfect example of that is what happened in the camp of Nahar al-Barid. Um, I was unable to uh, get permission to go to the camp in time. I had to leave after I got permission. In order to, to actually enter the camp, you have to, um, if you come from the outside, or if you're a Palestinian refugee who lives in the camp, you have to get a permit give, from the military because the military controls the whole camp. So I interviewed um, one of the, um, the head of the PFLP in Lebanon um, who, ne helped, who tried to negotiate with the Salafists who, inter who in, um, infiltrated into the camp. I don't know if you want me to tell the story of what happened with this camp, if we have time to do that. But yeah, yeah, go, 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 go. So um, during the war on, our, in, on Ir in Iraq, there were Salafist factions, extremist factions, not affiliated with Al-Qaeda, but who were extremists, um, who were um, filtering in and out of Syria. And Syrian intelligence agencies sent them, wanted to get rid of them. Um, so through a deal um, with American intelligence, um, they, and this, is, this is what you know, I heard, they sent them into Lebanon, basically sending them to their deaths, although they told them, you know, go to Lebanon and fight. This group was called uh, Fatah al-Islam. They were supplied with uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars from um, Saudi Arabian Salafist elements and uh, advanced weaponry, including night vision goggles. And once they realized that they were um, dead men walking, they decided to infiltrate the Palestinian refugee camps to be with those they, who they said were their brothers, not Palestinians, but Muslims. And the Palestinian factions in these camps immediately rejected their presence, went to the new homes they had bought, and said, who are you? And Fatah al-Islam members responded by shooting uh, members of the factions. Um, fighting ensued in Tripoli, and the Lebanese army decided to act. They decided to go into the camps, particularly Nahar al-Barid, where there was a, an especially radical and violent faction. And they did so with the consent of the Palestinian refugees. Um, the Palestinians um, from Nahar al-Barid agreed to leave and let the army um, have a free hand to fight Fatah al-Islam. And so they did so. They captured members of Fatah al-Islam's leadership killed many of them. The fighting concluded and then the army proceeded to destroy the entire camp because this was part of an ongoing program to eradicate Palestinian refugees from Lebanese life or to uh, in inaugurate a new program to control them, um, which is as bad or worse than anything Israel's done, uh, in my opinion. So. Um, people I interviewed from Nahar al-Barad told me that the factionalism and sectarianism of Lebanese society emerged as the camp was being destroyed because one soldier would cry about a house being burned and then another one would come and rocket the house. Then another soldier would save, uh, save a house and then another soldier from a different sect would come and destroy it. And the most, um, you know, the image that seared in my mind um, about the destruction of Nahar al-Barad is a story of an old woman whose house was burning and she ran inside um, and started looking for something by her bed and people tried to pull her away. It turned out she was looking for the deed to her house in historic Palestine. Um, so this was a second Nakba for the people of Nahar al-Barad. And as we speak, I think the uh, Lebanese council is debating a new program um, which will place the camps under military control, will ban all construction material, will prevent the UN from bringing construction material in. And it's all based on their blueprint for the rebuilding of Nahar al-Barid, which is currently completely controlled um, by the military. And they say that they're doing this in the actual plan for the benefit of Palestinian refugees. So if you visit a refugee camp in Lebanon, which are dramatically different from Jordan, where you get an image of dignified poverty, or in Syria, uh, what you're going to see um, will, will shock you in a way that is different than what you'll see maybe in the West Bank if you visit Balata or in Gaza. Because as soon as you walk out of the camp and you walk past uh, you know, burning trash and small children fishing through it, for, you're going to see Mercedes dealerships. You're going to see middle class and upper class life. Um, just go on with this, you know, uh, window of hell walled in um, behind you. And that's truly shocking, and I think it's uh, 
damning indictment of uh, what Lebanese society is.